A Series of Unfortunate Events by Lemony Stickett, Snicket, The Bad Beginning, Chapter 3, Part 2. Someone has just knocked on the door, um, and Klaus and Violet are surprised. So maybe somebody wants to visit us, Klaus said, without much hope. In the time since the Baudelaire parents' death, most of the Baudelaire orphans' friends had fallen by the wayside. An expression which here means they stopped calling, writing, and stopping by to see any of the Baudelaire's, making them very lonely. You and I, of course, would never do this to any of our grieving acquaintances. But it is a sad truth in life that when someone has lost a loved one, friends sometimes avoid the person just when the presence of friends is most needed. Violet, Klaus, and Sonny walked slowly to the front door and peered through the peephole, which was in the shape of an eye. They were delighted to see Justice Strauss peering back at them and open the door. Justice Strauss, Violet cried. How lovely to see you. She was about to add, do come in, but then she realized that Justice Strauss would probably not want to venture into the dim and dirty room. Please forgive me for not stopping by sooner, Justice Strauss said, as the Baudelaire stood awkwardly in the doorway. I wanted to see how you children were settling in, but I had a very difficult case in the high court, and it was taking up much of my time. What sort of case was it? Klaus asked, having been deprived of reading. He was hungry for new information. I can't really discuss it, Justice Strauss said, because it's official business, but I can tell you it concerns a poisonous plant and illegal use of someone's credit card. Yika! Sonny shrieked, which appeared to mean, how interesting. Although, of course, there was no way that Sonny could understand what was being said. Justice Strauss looked down at Sonny and laughed. Yika, indeed, she said, and reached down to pat the child on the head. Sonny took Justice Strauss' hand and bit it gently. That means she likes you, Violet explained. She bites very, very hard if she doesn't like you, or if you want to give her a bath. I see, Justice Strauss said. Now then, how are you children getting on? Is there anything you desire? The children looked at one another, thinking of all the things they desired. Another bed, for example, a proper crib for Sonny, curtains for the window in their room, a closet instead of cardboard box. But what they desired most of all, of course, was not to be associated with Count Olaf in any way whatsoever. What they desired most was to be with their parents, again, in their true home, but that, of course, was impossible. Violet, Klaus, and Sonny all looked down at the floor unhappily as they considered the question. Finally, Klaus spoke. Could we perhaps borrow a cookbook? He said. Count Olaf has instructed us to make dinner for his theatre troupe tonight, and we can't find a cookbook in the house. Goodness, Justice Strauss said. Cooking dinner for an entire theatre troupe seems like a lot to ask of children. Count Olaf gives us a lot of responsibilities, Violet said. What she wanted to say was, Count Olaf is an evil man but she was well-mannered. Well, why don't you come next door to my house, Justice Strauss said, and find a cookbook that pleases you. The youngsters agreed and followed Justice Strauss out the door and over to her well-kept house. She led them through an elegant hallway smelling of flowers into an enormous room, and when they saw what was inside, they nearly fainted from delight. Klaus especially. The room was a library, not a public library, but a private library, that is, a large collection of books belonging to Justice Strauss. There were shelves and shelves of them on every wall from the floor to the ceiling and separate shelves and shelves on, of them in the middle of the room. The only place there weren't books in, was in one corner where there were some large, <clears throat> comfortable-looking chairs and a wooden table with lamps hanging over them. Perfect for reading. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> I'm going to tickle. <coughs> Ooh. Although it was not as big as their parents' library, it was as cozy as the Baudelaire children were thrilled. My word, Violet said, this is a wonderful library. Thank you very much, Justice Strauss said. I've been collecting books for years. and I'm very proud of my collection. As long as you keep them in good condition, you are welcome to use any of my books at any time. Now, the cookbooks are over here on the eastern wall. Shall we have a look at them? Yes, Violet said. And then, if you don't mind, I shall love to look at any of your books concerning mechanical engineering. Inventing things is a great interest of mine. <laughs> And I would like to look at books on wolves, Klaus said. Recently, I've been fascinated by the subject of wild animals of North America. Book, Sonny shrieked, which meant, please don't forget to pick out a picture book for me. Justice Strauss smiled. It is a pleasure to see young people interested in books, she said. But first, I think we'd better find a good recipe, don't you? The children agreed, and for 30 minutes or so, they perused several cookbooks. That's a good word, perused that Justice Strauss recommended. To tell you the truth, the three orphans were so excited to be out of Count Olaf's house and in this pleasant library that they were a little distracted and unable to concentrate on cooking. 
but finally Klaus found a dish that sounded delicious and easy to make. Listen to this, he said. Puttanesca. It's an Italian sauce for pasta. All we need to do is saute olives, capers, anchovies, garlic, chopped parsley and tomatoes together in a pot and prepare spaghetti to go with it. That sounds easy, Violet agreed. And the Baudelaire orphans looked at one another. Perhaps with the kind Justice Strauss and her library right next door, the children could compare pleasant lives for themselves as easily as making Putinesca sauce for Count Olaf.